Good morning and welcome to First Memorial. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Please join me in the welcome and call to worship. Wait upon the Lord. Be strong and courageous. Wait upon the Lord. That's what Elizabeth did. She waited for a child, John the Baptist. Then she said to Mary, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Wait upon the Lord. Be strong and courageous. Wait upon the Lord. Please join me in the opening song, Come Lighter Hearts. God, our Savior, we ask for your mercy. Though we have heard Mary's song, we still seek security in pride and power and possessions. Though we know your story, we resist the costs of following you. We pass by those considered lowly in this world. We turn away from hungry people who still wait to be filled. Forgive us, we pray. Help us to work for the justice you intend. Make us messengers of the peace you bring. As we wait for you, turn our apathy into acts of love and service. We pray in the name of Emmanuel. Amen. Friends, God is for us and not against us. For that very reason, God sent the Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Believe this good news. Jesus Christ, we are for you. The hymn is number 22.
The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill my promise. I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness. He shall bring peace to our hearts, that we may bring his peace to the world. The peace of Christ be with you all. Without moving, please turn around and signal a cheerful greeting and a passing of the peace with those around you. Everybody behave today. Thank you very much. Please be seated. All right. So, can some of you guys come sit over here so then we can kind of see you over here too? Awesome. We have kids today, yay! Awesome! All right, girls, you can come back this way. Come back this way, sit by Austin. Your family, so you guys can sit together. Any further, they'll be Methodists. Well, yeah, I know, I know. Listen, getting them in the front row is big for Presbyterians, so we'll take yes. it. <laughs> well, that's Baptist. All right, so, today we are going to light the Advent candle for love. Love, yes. So, who are some people that you guys love? Family, very good. Jesus, yes. What about you, Morgan? Your sisters, very good. Austin, do you who do you Austin, who do you love? Okay, well, we're not going to say that one out loud because he said Santa, but that's only because he thinks he's getting presents this week. All right, so now, who do you think loves us? Sebastian. Jesus, very good. Who else? Anybody else? He's the only one that loves us? Your parents, very good. Yeah, your mom's saying, yeah, your parents. Austin, who loves you? Anybody else? Me? Yeah. <laughs> Who do you think, Abby? God. Very good. Yes. So, Pastor Allen. Yes. Everybody here loves you guys and is so excited to see you here. So, do you guys remember when you started to love? Do you remember? Was it when you were seven? Was it when you were 10? Was it when you were two? Three or four, yeah. What about you, Sebastian? Do you remember? You don't know, right? It's just maybe something that you've just always done, right? From the time that you were born, maybe? At least your parents, right? You loved your parents from the time you were born. Yes. And your sister, too. Yeah, because you have a big sister. All right. When you didn't know anything? Yeah. All right. So, you started to love when you were born, but guess what? People loved you way before that. Your parents loved you before that. Your family loved you before that. And God loved you before that, right? So in today's story, well, in today's lesson, sorry, not story, we're going to hear about when Mary is pregnant with baby Jesus. Remember we talked about that in Sunday school and she had to go on a trip and everything? Yes. Well, Austin, sit down. Now, before that, she went to visit her cousin Elizabeth. Who here has a cousin? Who here has cousins? Everybody has cousins, right? You guys are all sitting in the same row. Now, when Elizabeth, Mary goes to say hi to Elizabeth, and Elizabeth says hi, guess what? Mary feels the baby move inside of her stomach. Have you guys ever felt a baby move inside of somebody's stomach? No? Yeah, you can wait till you get it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, they start kicking and stuff because the baby was so excited because they heard Elizabeth's voice. So, the baby already knew that Elizabeth was somebody that was going to love him, right? Baby Jesus knew that, that when he was born, he was going to have a whole bunch of people that loved him. So, guess what? That love has carried on for hundreds and hundreds of years, right? Because who do we still love? 
Who was one of our people that we said we loved? Jesus, right, God, very good. All right, so we need to remember that when we're having a bad day and maybe, you know, just kind of down in the dumps, God always loves us no matter what, and we always love God, right? All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for sending your son so that we could know love and that we could love him as well. Amen. All right. Come on, guys. No, sit down. Last Sunday, we lit the candle of joy. We light it and the handled candles of hope and peace again as we remember that Christ, who was born in Bethlehem, will come again to fulfill all of God's promises and bring us everlasting peace and joy. The fourth candle of Advent is the candle of love. God's love is a perfect love. It holds nothing back. God in love gives us everything we need to live a life of hope and peace. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus shows us God's perfect love. This is what love is like. Love is patient. Love is kind and envies no one. Love is never boastful or conceited, rude or selfish. Love is not quick to take offense. It keeps no records of wrongs. It does not gloat over other people's troubles, but rejoices in the right, the good, and the true. There is nothing that love cannot face. There is no limit to its faith, to its hope, to its endurance. Love never ends. We light the candle of love to remind us that Jesus brings us God's love and shows us how to love others. Love is like a light shining in a dark place. As we look at this candle, we celebrate the love we find in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for the love you give us. We ask that as we wait for all your promises to come true and for Christ to come again, that you would remain present with us. Help us today and every day to worship you to hear your word, and to do your will by sharing your love with each other. We ask it in the name of the one who was born in Bethlehem. Amen. The pink one still needs to be screwed some more. Okay, the scripture lesson today comes from the book of Luke, chapter 1, verses 39 through 45. Please consider following the reading in your pew Bible by, tur by turning to the New Testament, page 57. Now hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. 
In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to do it to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are among the women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me that the, the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my, in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I actually hate to see them leave. <laughs> According to Reed Lessing, who wrote this, this is a warning. What you're about to hear is a sermon about nothing, and you're familiar with that. In fact, we can admit that because of circumstances beyond our control, this will be the most nothing sermon you've ever heard. We begin with this warning not to encourage blank stares and closed eyelids. No, and I'll be watching. We're being warned because Elizabeth's life can be summarized with one word, N-O-T-H-I-N-G. Think about it. Elizabeth was a barren woman, unable to have children, which was a real problem in first century Middle East culture. You were either defective or you were bad, or somebody in your family had been bad. But you're supposed to be able to bear children, and when you can't, well, there's still some lingering today, you know, people who can't and try and try and try. It's so heartbreaking. After all that effort, and to some extent all that money, still not be able, especially when you want a child so badly for your own reasons. And Luke tells us that both Elizabeth and her husband, Zachariah, were advanced in years, beyond what we call child rear child producing years fertile years when it came to having children elizabeth and zachariah were over the hill start a family now that ship sailed a long time ago for those two in luke 125 we learned that elizabeth felt great reproach Another word for that would be S-H-A-M-E. Guilt is sin done by us, but shame is sin done to us. Guilt is what we feel when we've done wrong. Shame is what we feel when someone has wronged us when we feel overwhelmed with depression and doubt and insecurity and despair. It's all components of shame. Guilt is sin done by us. More importantly for this purpose, shame is sin done to us. Many churches today recite the Lord's Prayer saying, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. I still have trouble with that because I was raised in a time when you only sinned against God. At least that's all the Presbyterian Church ever talked about. People sinning against me, 
flew right by. Nobody explained that to us in Sunday school. Bad Sunday school teachers. No, kidding, kidding, kidding. Historically, the church has had plenty to say about guilt, right? But the church has frequently been silent about shame, doesn't know how to handle it, doesn't know what to do with it, doesn't want to embarrass anybody. God cares, however, about both the damage done by us and the damage done to us. Read the Bible carefully. And it says as much about shame as it does about guilt. It does. The Bible talks both about the sinner as well as about those wounded by sin, which leads to shame. I'll be repeating that last phrase over and over again. Please get the point if you got nothing else when you walk out of here. Shame is what is done to us. And nobody should be in the business of shaming others. Nobody. Not a parent, not a teacher, not a minister, not a neighbor. I'm editing. I have a personal shaming experience as a child. I think we'll leave that out. The story of Elizabeth is a story about shame, when sin is done to us, when we feel or made to feel worthless, when we feel like just a little bit of nothing. We're told, directly or indirectly, that we are nothing. Shame, as we all know, in and of itself, is shaming. It's all a vicious circle. Just ask Elizabeth. As a woman of a certain age, unable to have children, she seems doomed. She owns stock in the Olympia Typewriter Company. That's a company that went defunct. Elizabeth has a ticket on the Titanic. If we knew then what we know now, who would have wanted to get on it? She's got a seat on the Hindenburg. And why is that? Elizabeth feels like one huge, unnoticed nothing because she couldn't have children and the people of her culture shamed her. Elizabeth joined the ranks of many women who have been shamed. Sari is described in the words, remember, before she was called Sarah, Sari is described in the words, she was barren, there was not to her even a child. Genesis 11.30. This is Abraham's Sari. Rebecca, Genesis 25.21. Rachel, Genesis 29.31. Manoah's wife, Judges 13.2, and Hannah, 1 Samuel 2.5, are also described as infertile with no descendants and suffered being shamed. We all know what shame feels like. Shame can come to those branded by a divorce, marked by a handicapped, growing up with alcoholic parents that everybody in the neighborhood knew about, or embarrassed because of a child's arrest. We may feel stigmatized because we lost the game. We lost our job. We lost our spouse. We lost our house. We lost our life's savings. And now everybody knows and has their nose in our business. There are many ways we can experience public shame in our lives. There's public shame, but there's also private shame. Many of us might know what that feels like, too. Maybe you've been pushed to the edge by a critical spouse, or been berated by an angry parent, or scorned by a sneaky superior, 
or teased by a bully as a child. No one else realizes what that's done to you. But you're keenly aware. You know, and that's enough to bury you in shame. Whether it's public or private, unless we deal with shame, the dawn will never come. The new day will never arrive. Oh, we can try putting our hands over our ears, splashing water on our face, or going for a long drive. Try as we might to shake the shame. It doesn't work. We still feel like one huge, otherwise unnoticed, nothing. But one day for Elizabeth, everything changed. She became pregnant with John the Baptist. And yet what really changed Elizabeth was the day that Mary showed up. Mary was pregnant with God. That's right. Mary was pregnant with God the Son. To make this point, Luke describes Mary's encounter with Elizabeth by recalling the time David brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. Note these connections between Mary's journey to see Elizabeth with David's journey to transport the Ark. First, both Mary, Luke 139, and David arose and made a journey. 2 Samuel 6.2 and both go up to the hill country of Judah. Second, Elizabeth's greeting to Mary, a loud cry, Luke 142, is used in the Greek Old Testament only in connection with the ark, the ark of the covenant, the ark that carried the Ten Commandments, the ark that the Jews carried before them in battle, that ark, the one that was put in the tent of meeting every night while they were wandering in the wilderness. Third, David asked in 2 Samuel 6, 9, how shall the ark of the Lord come to me? Meaning, why does it come to me? What have I done to deserve this honor, this responsibility? And Elizabeth asks, why should this happen to me? That the mother of my Lord, though she be a cousin, should come to visit me. Think of all the spiritual things she ought to be doing, all the responsibilities. More than Queen Elizabeth, the most profound monarch in British history. How about that? How, if you were Mary, I know it's hard for you guys to think this way, but if you were Mary, what would you be thinking? How did this come to me? I had a friend who was excited to introduce me to his friend who was a very famous scholar, writer, preacher. His name was Dr. Bruce Larson. I read many of his books and I miss him for a while. He betrayed his Presbyterian roots and worked for Robert Schuller, but we won't go there. We mustn't be possessive. You're supposed to smile at that. Thank you, Jeanette, my dear. Fourth. The ark blessed the home of Obed-Edom, 2 Samuel 6. So too Mary's presence blessed Elizabeth's home. Blessings were brought by those who bore these great responsibilities. You remember when you brought your first child home and you worried that you were going to be up to the task of taking care of this child? Did you ever drop him or her? I have a friend. I still have a friend, fortunately. 
Her son was a teenager at the time I was visiting her home that day, and we were in the kitchen, and we were uh, having this deep theological conversation, and Tony comes bounding in playing the clown, which he was very good at. He was also very smart and very loving and very many other positive things, but he was very entertaining. And when he had finished his little act and pranced out of the kitchen, I turned to his mother and I said, how old was he when you dropped him on his head? And she said, a little over a year. I just turned my back on him for a second. I don't know why God wired me up to say outrageous things. Sometimes they're entertaining and sometimes they're upsetting. And she was upset for a little while. That happened back in the 70s. I spoke to her on the phone just the other night and I said, do you remember when? And she said, yes, and I really did just turn my back on him for a second. He was right there on the counter. I was changing his diaper. I had to reach for a pen. And, and I said, Jane, you missed the point. I feel bad. She said, don't. I'm the one that dropped him. <laughs> Jane, I hope you're not watching this today <laughs> in Lexington, Nebraska on your computer. I hope Tony isn't either, by the way. Fourth, the ark blessed the home of Obed. Did I say that already? It seems like I did. Do you see all these connections, all four of them? Both the ark and Mary house the one true God. I never heard that sentence before from anybody. But the ark was the vessel that contained to the extent it's able to contain God, which is why they carried it around with such reverence with them to keep God's presence. And Mary carried God the Son around in her body until she gave birth to him. Nobody else but David and Mary can claim that fame because nobody else but Mary and David shouldered that responsibility. And yet, to a lesser extent, you and I do carry Jesus around with us in our smile, in our warm greeting, in our hospitality, in our love, in our being able to forgive others convincingly. You and I do carry Jesus around with us to a lesser extent, to an imperfect extent, speaking for myself. I am so imperfect, but I should not be claiming that as any thing for notoriety. Everybody knows it. But it's no wonder Elizabeth calls Mary the child in Mary, the Lord, my Lord. Out of shame and despair and guilt and waiting comes rejoicing for Elizabeth. After she goes through those early stages we all live and know well comes rejoicing because of the arrival of God's Son inside her. The pain of the past is replaced with the joy of new life and the promise of life everlasting without yet, at this stage in Mary's life and Jesus, any idea what it's gonna cost at the end of the road, at the top of Golgotha, the pain, the suffering, the embarrassment. I mean, here is her son with only a shred of a garment, hanging in agony before the entire town. And he's hanging there because he's deemed guilty. That's pretty embarrassing. His first miracle, Jesus this is, was the result of embarrassed hosts at a wedding looking at their supply of wine and coming up empty. 
Then there was the widow of Nain, Jairus, blind Bartimaeus, the Canaanite woman, Zacchaeus, Mary Magdalene, Lazarus, the disciples who said, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish. Send them to 7-Eleven. Let them get their own supper, figuratively speaking. And countless others, besides those just named, who came up with zip, zero, zilch, nada, goose eggs, nothing. They had nothing. Jesus takes away our guilt. That's sin done by us. But Jesus also shows up to take away our shame, the sin that's done to us. He came to heal both of those conditions, which are human conditions. Conditions of imperfect people living amongst imperfect people. How did the Savior do it? He became the lowliest scrap of nothing. Shame is difficult for us, yet it was catastrophic in the days of Jesus. His society had a much stronger sense that a person could be put to shame by people, should be put to shame by people, to correct them, to make them better people, to make them worthy to be in that family, to make them worthy to be in that community because in those days, in those small towns, everybody was related to everybody. One person, child or adult, gets out of line and the whole group feels responsible and affected and judged by the behavior of one. When we survey ancient Roman literature, we arrive at one conclusion. The horror of crucifixion was its utter and unspeakable shame not the physical pain. It was the shame. The courage it took Mary to stand there on the edge of the crowd and watch this happen. Joseph didn't have the chutzpah to do that. You all know what chutzpah is. And the group of men in a position to honor Christ, the disciples and the Jewish leaders, betrayed him, denied him, judged him, condemned him, treated him with contempt, thus piling shame upon shame upon shame. Except I'm not so sure Jesus accepted that judgment. He knew it was all part of the deal of dying for all of those ill-behaved people. Paul puts it this way, being in very nature God, we did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. He who made himself nothing. Philippians 2, 6. The apostle continues, he humbled himself and became obedient to death even because of its shameful nature, even death on a cross. Philippians 2.8. We need to clarify these words in Philippians. Humble service, putting others first. I'm going to say that one again. Humble service we were put here for. Putting others first. Not doing for others so we could feel good about our generosity. Not doing for others so that people can look at us and say what good people we are. Putting others first, not our egos first. Accepting even the shame of the cross is not something Jesus does despite being God. It's a demonstration of exactly who God is. In the first century, in the Middle East, 
when people were excited who had taken Jesus into their hearts and begun to live for him and wanted to share, we call that evangelism, <gasps> wanted to share their faith in him, the usual response they got was, he was a criminal, wasn't he? He died on a cross, didn't he? What are you talking about? How can he be God? He's bad to the bone. God shows solidarity with the shamed. God shows solidarity with people who feel like they are nothing because they've been made to feel like nothing. How so? The owner of all things, he says, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of God has no place to lay his head, no place to call home. Not borrowed space, not rented space, not mortgaged space, nothing. Ningunada. Matthew 8, 20. Not the Ningunada part. The king of kings, he became a slave. The creator, he is spit on by his creatures. The source of truth, he is found guilty of a lie, unjustly. The source of light, for three hours he hangs in the darkness on a cross. The source of life, he is crucified, dead and buried, and descends into hell. I love the church I grew up in, but there were people that were just too pure to say the word hell, so they said Hades. I didn't find that out till I went to college. Hell? In church? OMG. He goes from the pinnacle of praise in the universe to the ultimate absolute nothing. He out nothings Mary. He out nothings Elizabeth. He out nothings anybody you have ever known, and he out nothings you. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. It's a short, overweight, not like the pictures we put in the Sunday school rooms. Person of color. So many of those pictures were done by Germans. So they have blondish hair and they have pale white skin, this Jesus they paint. And they're moving and inspiring to all of us. But that's not what he looked like. And nothing against Germans. But the joy comes because when nothing is multiplied beyond all hope, there is resurrection. Now that's an equation for you. When nothing is multiplied beyond all hope, there is resurrection. There is rebirth. There is new life or rejuvenated life. Because Jesus is alive, God freely gives us the blessings of Christ's rich healing blood that flows from his wounds. What does it mean for us, the shamed? And if nobody here thinks anybody's ever shamed them, you're not digging deep enough into your memories. I think it's humanly impossible not to have been affected by that at some point by someone. Satan's really good at getting people to do that to us. Yes, I believe there is a Satan. You should too. What's it, what does it mean for us? What does it mean? It means joy. It means rejoicing. The key word. It's in the title of the sermon. It's in the title of the day. It means gladness beyond all gladness. It means a total reversal of our lives from where we were to where we are now that we know how much 
Jesus loves us. Without reservation. We don't have to drink our shame away, work our shame away, explain our shame away, eat our shame away, cry our shame away, or bury our shame away. In place of shame, Jesus gives J O Y. You feel that? I hope so, or I would hate that gift of his to be wasted on us. In the place of shame, Jesus gives joy. Joy overflowing, unutterable, and immense joy. Joy that is indescribable. Joy that you have trouble telling somebody else that you're trying to convince of God's love and forgiveness. And it's so hard to put into words because you have no reference point. Don't we use examples to explain what we mean? Elizabeth tells Mary, For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, my baby in my womb leapt for joy. Luke 1, Today's memory verse. Have any of you memorized the memory verses I've been giving you this Lent? This Lent. <laughs> Shoot me. This Advent. Few of us are mathematicians, but I'll try to answer an equation that eludes us all too often. Here it goes. Jesus plus absolute nothing equals absolutely everything. Jesus plus absolutely nothing equals absolutely everything. That's Elizabeth's story of waiting and rejoicing. It can be ours as well. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. I love you, Ed. I never would have thought of you as choir material. <laughs> Thank you. There were others, but you were audible. <laughs> Amen. Amen? Let me say, as I've had said for the last few weeks, the gifts of our stewardship are never stuck in transit, waiting at a dock to port, or already sold out. Stewardship gifts come in the form of time, talent, and treasure, and are wrapped up in love. And I repeat, if your gifts aren't wrapped up in love, don't give them here, no matter what the trustees tell you. <laughs> I have to be true to myself. Whether by the postal service or by an offering plate, let us send our gifts to God now.
Let us pray with one voice. Accept our gifts as signs of our gratitude for what you give us every day and as honor to your presence in our world. For the sake of those who stand in need and Jesus Christ who saves us. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Kim, is that yes. you? Good morning. Good morning. Okay, this week's birthdays. Mabel Cullum on December 21st, Carol Gratikos on December 22nd, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on December 25th. Prayers of love. For God so loved the world, he gave us his son, Jesus Christ, whose birth we celebrate this week. Bless everyone with love, that we may love everyone as you have loved us, that we may show patience, tolerance, kindness, caring, and love to all. May each of you be blessed with the love of the season. May we continue to show God's love and our ever-growing list. May each of you be held in strength during this time this week, especially those that are dealing with illnesses. Alice, Angel, Allison, Andrew, Antoinette, Armando, Anne, Barbara, Benjamin, Bruce, Christine, Catherine, Claudette, Darlene, David, Debbie, Diana, Dan, Donna, Dawn, Eni, Eddie, Ellen, Florence, Gary, Gabby, Gina, Helen, Jay, Janet, Jonathan, Jody, Joanne, John, Julia, Jasper, Judy, Karen, Ken, Kim, Keith, Kyle, Kathy, Larry, Linda, Lorraine, Lily, Morgan, Nancy, Nishabi, Owen, Peter, Pat, Paulette, Paul, Sheila, Scott, Sarah, Stephen, Ted, Tim, Rick, Richard, Taryn, Tony, Tracy, Walter, Wayne, Thelma, Irene, Alexa, Nora, Pastor Allen, and Brian. Thank you. We believe. How did that get so close to me? We believe, so we pray. O oh God of time and eternity, we are very aware of how much time is left until the time for us to prepare is up for this Christmas. Please surround our frantic, vulnerable hearts with the assurance of your love and power to carry us through the worst life has to offer as well as to dance for joy with us during its greatest moments. Our minds are keenly aware of all those who can't make it home for this Christmas, especially those in uniform around the world. We yearn to hold them in our arms again on some wonderful day in the future. We are holding all those who are dear to us close in prayer because we have been taught by the scriptures that we do not know the day or the hour but we are in your care. 
May we never take them for granted, nor your love for them. And of the many who are known to us to be in need of every kind of healing or relief, we pray for each condition to be resolved for your glory. Please watch over our church family and foster faith which sustains us, overcoming the handiwork of the evil one, which is shame. Bless us with nurturing prayer in our relationship with you, even as we sing or just listen to the classic rendition of Jesus' prayer as we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The hymn is number 16. light of God's love shine through what you say and do when you're happy and when you're hurting, when you're confident and when you're uncertain. 
until that day when you're received into God's eternal kingdom where there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, and no more tears. Amen. Please be seated for the postlude and I'm reminding you of Christmas Eve in this room at 5 p.m. Hope that many, if not all of you, can be here. And also, following the postlude, um, our friend Donald has some very important words to share with us. Good morning, everybody. Uh, in November, we had Ed and Tom do sermons. They were very good, very, very good. On November the 28th, it was first Sunday in Advent, Danette talked about angels, about angels in the church, all right? and. It was very good. Like I said, the other two who did sermons were very good. And I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna throw, hope I'm not repeating, but Jeanette's was very good. It was about angels. And I looked in the dictionary, and I got two uh, things about what angels means. And one says angels with wings, which we already know that. And the second one is messengers of God. And you know, uh, I've been in this church for a long time, and uh, we used to go to, uh, I'm trying to example of people who have maybe have angels in their house that somebody has passed on, and they have a picture of, their, of a person who passed on. And I used to go to a lady's house. She was a member of this church, and we're not going to mention the name, we're going to say angels. And one year, she was, you know, she was in the choir for many years, and she did the choir picnic for many years. And one year, we walked into her house, and in the foyer 
was a hand-painted picture of her husband, who happened to pass away suddenly, and there was two big angels on both sides, one on the left and one on the right. It, I, I, I'm trying to exp- I couldn't believe it. It, it. it took you back. When you looked at it, I said, oh my God, how beautiful. And then there was another example. I went to Ruth Shaw's funeral and down to repast. And on the table, they were giving out little angels. And I took two of those angels. And I took them home and I put them around my mother's picture. I'm sorry. I'm crying. I shouldn't do that. But that's okay, I guess. And I had put the two angels on both sides, left and right. And you know, we're referring to angels. And that's why I gave you two examples of angels. And, and then there's, you know, they're on the table. And like I said, uh, Jeanette also talked about angels in the church. She did not use names. And I'm not going to use names, too. I'm going to say angels. There are a lot of angels in this church that do things. And we appreciate it very much. They come forward and do things. And like I said before, I'm not going to use names at all about, uh, about uh, what they do in the church. And over here, we have four big poinsettias. Angels bought these poinsettias and put them there. And they are in memory of all our church members that passed over the years. And unfortunately, the last one to pass away in our church was the late beloved Charles Yearwood. So that's why these, all these poinsettias are here, by angels of the church. And now we're going to talk about some people in the church have done things. They come here volunteering, doing things. And I won't say their names, but you're going to figure out who we're talking about. One angel is, she works, she goes to New York every day and works. She comes here, she does her thing, her and her husband, Kenny, I'm I'm coming to date out already, (laughs) sorry about that, I had to do it. And she's got three lovely little kids. Like I said, I'm, I'm like a broken wreck, I'm saying it over, she comes here every week, does her thing. She, they got three big dogs to take care of, and we appreciate her coming here and do it and doing her thing. And the only time she took off when she went up to where her father takes them every year, up to I don't I don't know what the name of the place, but they enjoyed herself being up there. And then there's Kim, her sidekick, who comes here. She takes her of her father. She does the camera work too, and then. She goes up and rings the bells. And times during the summer, when I'm working out, well, outside working, people said, we didn't hear the bells, what's going on? I said, right now, she's on sick leave. She has some health so she had to take care of it. Oh, we're so sorry, but we're wondering what happened to the bells. Because the people around here, oh, where's the bells? So thank you guys. And another guy, another person is, who for six and a half years came in here, did his thing four or five days a week, and if we called him, he would be here. And he gave, you know, he came in, like I said, four hours a day, a week, and did his thing. We thank this guy, an angel too. And what we have here, uh, excuse me, guys, I just got to, uh, if I can get him out of here. One, we got two, all right. These are baskets of fruit for Kim, uh, Megan, and Ed. We appreciate what you've done for these, like Sam and Ed, over six years, six and a half years, and the two ladies come here, like I said, every Sunday, and we do it again, and take care of them, and they have to do it. It's a pleasure to have these people, they're doing it, and we, in church, are going to call these people angels, and we do have a lot of angels around. I'm not just thinking. Don't say anything, but just do it. 
Thank you, Kevin. And another thing, when in doubt, <coughs> write it out. When in doubt, write it out. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, John.